Hello, church family. It's so good to see you today. Well, I know I can't see you, but you can see me. And we miss you guys. It's been three weeks since we got to meet together. So I thought this week that we would do the sermon from up here on stage. So with your large screen TVs at home, it can feel like you're right here with us this morning. We miss you guys. I want to let you know we are still doing ministry here at Ballard. In fact, you got some of you know that I was out at some of your homes. I got to pray with some of you. I got to talk to some of you. And then some of you, I even dropped off toilet paper for you. So we're still doing ministry here. I want to let you know next week, the girls of grace, they're going to meet together on Zoom. The guys are going to meet together, two pass. They're, they're going to meet together on Thursday on Zoom. We're even talking about having a prayer meeting on Zoom for those that want to get together and pray and hear a word from the Lord. Because these are times people are pretty worried and anxious about a lot of things. Even before this whole coronavirus happened, Americans have been more anxious now than ever before in history. And this is skyrocketed once, once this coronavirus happened. And there's a verse in the Bible I want to read to you this morning from Proverbs 20, uh, 12, 25. And it says this, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. But a good word makes him glad. Anxiety is like a weight that we put on top of us and it drains us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we have to carry it around and we're not meant to do that. We're not meant to do that. But like I said, Americans are anxious. We're anxious about a lot of things. I have this backpack here. We're going to say this is an anxiety, anxiety we're supposed to carry. And it's pretty light when there's nothing in it. But when we start adding weight to it, it gets more heavier to carry. And Americans are anxious about a lot of things. And one thing that America, is, what makes people worry a lot is what people think of them. This isn't just for teenagers. No, man, this is for everybody, even the grandparents. Everybody worries about what people think of them. That's why you cut the grass outside of your home. That's why you buy the car you do and you dress the way you, you dress. People, you don't outgrow it for some reason, but you're worried about what other people think. And when we add that to the bag, and then we add things like school. What school am I going to get into? Will I get into a good school so I can have a good future? We add that to our worries. And then we have worries about things like, what about a job? What job am I supposed to have? And is my job a good job? And will my job be around in five years from now? And we add that to our worries. And then we worry about things like, man, who am I going to marry? And, and if I'm married, will my marriage last? And how can I keep my marriage healthy and strong? And we add that to our worries. And then we worry about things like our kids. Now, what about our kids? Are they going to grow up knowing Christ? And are they going to be good? Or are they going to get into trouble a lot? And then we worry about things like, man, how are my kids going to turn out? We add that to our bag of worries. And then we have worries such as, will I make enough money? What about my retirement? Will I have enough money to retire someday? Will I have enough money to pay the bills? And all these worries keep adding up. And even about, what about the future, my future, and the future of America? How's the next election going to turn out? And we all add all these things to our bag of worries. And even though some of them are little worries, they add up to be one big problem. And then we throw that on our back, and we try to carry that around. Man, and it really weighs us down. It drains our energy. It zaps us of how we're supposed to be living for Christ and it slows us down and weighs us out so we can't even serve other people. And then I even haven't even added on a worldwide pandemic that we're going through right now. When you add that to the, to the list, man, we even have more worries than that, that we got to carry around. Now we got to worry about, will I keep my job? How am I going to pay my bills if I lose my job? My, my kids are going to be out of school for four more weeks. How is that going to happen? And will they graduate? And what about work and health in our future? And the biggest one of all that seems to be weighing everybody down is, will there be enough toilet paper? Man, we have all these worries that are weighing us down. And 
then this pandemic hits and it feels like it can cripple us. And then we either do one or two things negatively. We either become prideful and we say, well, I know better. This isn't going to affect me. I don't have to listen to anybody and what they tell me. Or we become so fearful, we become paralyzed. And God doesn't want us to live in either way. And today we're going to be looking at Job. because it, And Job's friends were so prideful sometimes, saying, just saying, God, Job, if you live right like we're living, God will bless you. But they also live in fear. Man, if I don't do right, man, God will punish us. And, and Job was saying, no, no, God's not that way. So we're going to look at Job. We're going to be in chapter 20. And we're going to be going through chapter 26. And then we're going to jump over to the New Testament, to Matthew 6, and hear a word from Jesus. But before we do, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray right now for, there's a lot of people out here today that are worried and anxious about a lot of different things. I just pray that you just allow them to put those anxieties on the back burner for right now. There's some people that are worried about this coronavirus. I pray that you just put that out of their mind for the moment. And Lord, let us just hear from you. Heavenly Father, we just pray that your spirit will speak to our spirit this morning. And we'll hear a good word from you that will encourage us and inspire us and motivate us and build us up to be more like you. In Jesus' wonderful and glorious name I pray. Amen. All right, we're in the book of Job, and if you don't know what Job is, if you just take your Bible and open it up to the middle, you hit the book of Psalms. And once you hit Psalms, you just go back, you go forward to the front of the book, the Bible, one book, and you will hit the book of Job. It's spelled J-O-B. And Job was a man who is going through a hard time. In fact, Job just lost everything he had. He was one of the richest men on earth. And he lost all his ways of making an income. He lost everything he had in one day, including his children. And now, he not only did he lose his family, and that he lost his means of income and all his income, now he has sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and he's sitting in an ash pile, scraping the wounds with a broken pot, wondering why this is happening. And Job had... Three good friends that came by to encourage him, and they sat with him for seven days. And on the seventh day, Job spoke up, and he was saying, I wish I never was born, because if I was never born, I wouldn't be going through all this pain. And after Job got done speaking, each one of his friends spoke to him. And they spoke to him these half-truths about God, and each time Job answered them. And basically, the half-truths were the same thing every time. Basically, their whole argument about why Job is going through this suffering is that Job must be a bad person. Job must have done something wrong, or God would have blessed him. The whole thing is this works-based theology that if we do good, if we worship God right, if we give our time and our resources and help the poor and love God, God will bless us and prosper us with health, wealth, and prosperity. And if we don't, and if we think about ourselves and we're selfish and wicked, God will punish us in this life. And Job's saying, that's not true. So today, we're, we have a lot of chapters to go through, but we're only going to hit a few verses from each to highlight what these friends are talking about. So Job is sitting there, and he needs an encouraging word, and his friend Zophar speaks up for the last time, and he says this. He says, do you not know this from old? since man was placed on earth. So he's saying, man, from ever since the beginning of Adam and Eve, don't you know this, Job? And it goes on in verse, uh, verse 5 of chapter 20 and says, that the exalting of the wicked is short, and the joy of, of the goodness but for a moment. Basically what he's saying, his whole argument is, Job, don't you know that from the very beginning, that the wicked will have a good time for a little bit, but then God will punish them. The wicked will be joyful for a little bit, but then God will take the joy away from them. And basically, he's accusing Job of this. So Job speaks up and he says, Keep listening to my words and let this be your comfort. Bear with me and I will speak. And after I have spoken, mock on. Job is saying, man, if it would just be better if you didn't say anything, you just listen to me. But at least listen to what I have to say now. When I'm done, you, then you can keep on making fun of me. And Job goes on to say this in chapter 21, verse 7. He says, Why do the wicked live and reach old age and grow mighty in power? Their offsprings are established in their presence 
and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, and no rod of God is upon them. Job is saying, you know what? The wicked don't suffer in this life. The wicked live to an old age, and even their kids and their grandkids go on to prosper. God's not punishing the wicked in this life. And then Job says in verse 27, he says, Hey, behold, I know your thoughts and your schemes to wrong me. Job is saying, I know what you're doing. You're supposed to be my friend, but you're saying I'm one of these wicked people. And that's why that's happening to me. So then Job goes on and he says, How then will you comfort me with these empty nothings? There is nothing left of your answer but falsehood. Job is saying, everything that you're saying is a lie, it's not true, and it's not comforting me. Comforting me. You're saying, it's because of my wickedness why I'm doing this, and it's not true, and it's not helping. So then his, a second friend jumps in, Alphaz, and he jumps in, and this guy's a smooth talker. But he can't stand it anymore, and he jumps in, and look what he says about Job. He actually has to make up stuff about Job, and he says this, he says, Is not your evil and abundant? There is no end to your iniquities. He's telling Job, Job, you're so evil, there's no end to him. You are terrible. And he goes on in, in um, verse 6 of chapter 22, and he says, For you have took pledges from your brothers for nothing, and stripped the naked of their clothes, you have given no water to the weary to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. He's saying, Job, you are terrible. You, you even take advantage of people that are starving to death, and you won't help them out. He's making stuff up about Job to fit his theology that God punishes the wicked. Because see, Job right now is going through a world of hurt. He lost his family. He lost his money, he lost his possessions, and he's in physical pain. And these guys, their theology is that he can only be going through this because God must be punishing him. And then he goes on and he lies about what Job thinks about God in verse 13. He says, but you say, Job, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? He's, this guy's saying, Job, you, you even tell us that God can't see what you're doing. You're hiding it from him. But God does see, because he's punishing you. And Job never said that. When you read the book of Job, and what we've read already in the past couple weeks, Job has a high view of God. And Job knows God sees what he's doing. And then he goes on, and he says, this sounds good. It sounds like a lot of preachers today, listen to this in, in verse 21. He says, agree with God and be at peace. And thereby good will come to you. Job, just repent and you'll be at peace with God, and God will bless you again. Job, this serve God, and help out the poor, and get right with God, and you will have prosperity. It sounds good. It sounds right, but it's a lie. So then Job replies, and he doesn't really reply to him at all. He's more talking to himself out loud, and Job asks himself a really important question, and he says, where is God in all of this? Where is God during all, all of this? Why isn't he here? And take a look at what Job says. He says, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might, that I might come even to his seat. This is in chapter 23, verse 3. Job is saying, man, if I could just know where to find God, then I could go ask him why this is happening to me. Now, Job isn't doing his, this as conceited, and he's not saying, man, if I could just find God, I would say, God, why are you doing this to me? No, he's just saying, God, man, I, can't, I don't feel your presence here. Why, God, are you doing this? And in verse 8, listen, it says, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, be, and backwards, but I do not perceive him. Job is saying, man, I'm looking for you, God. I'm looking for you. I'm calling out to you. I'm looking all over to find you, but... You don't seem to be near me. And in verse 10, it's an amazing verse. Check this out. He says, but he knows the way that I take. Job knows that God knows what's going on. Job knows that God is there, even if he doesn't perceive him or feel his presence. Those are wonderful words from a guy going through what Job is going through. And it's true for us here today. We might say, God, why are we going through this? I don't understand, God. Where are you? 
And God's right here with us, even if we don't feel like him. And Job goes on to ask another question, and, and he says this, why is God quiet? And I wish that he would judge people now. And look at, look at chapter 24, verse 2, Job says, some people move landmarks, that means that they steal their property, and they seize flocks and pastures. And it goes on in verse 4, and it says, they thrust the poor off the roads. Man, Job is saying, what's going, man, the evil people just go from bad to worse, and nothing happens to them. And in verse 22, Job says, yet God prolongs the life of the mighty by his power. They rise up, and they despair of life. He gives them security, and they are supported. Job is saying, man, the wicked people, they're just going from bad to worse. The poor people and the people that are trying to do right seem to be getting nowhere. And this is true, even in the New Testament, listen to this verse. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, indeed, that means in fact. It says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It says, well, evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse. It's saying the same thing. It's saying evil people will go from bad to worse. And good people who are even wanting to live a godly life are going to be persecuted. And that's what's happening to Job. Job wants to live a godly life, and he's being persecuted, it seems like. And these bad people are just getting more and more things. And Job doesn't understand it, but he's going to trust God anyways. Because listen to this in verse 23, it says, And God's eyes are upon their ways. Job knows that God is watching, and God will judge in the end for eternity. Maybe not in this life, but in eternity, God will judge. So now the third friend of Job speaks up. He can't stand it anymore. And his third friend speaks up, and his name is Bildad. And Bildad, he's cold, and he doesn't have very good feelings towards Job. And this is in verse 25, and he speaks up, and he basically says, How then can man be right before God? How can he who is born of woman be pure? And he goes on and, and he says, How much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? He's saying to Job, Job, you are the worst of the worst. You can't be right to God. You, I, This is happening to you because you are wrong, Job. And Job has enough, and he cuts him off after six verses. And Job says this, How have you helped him who has no power? How have, how have you saved the arm that has no strength? He's going, how are you helping me? You're doing nothing to help me. If anything, you're hurting me even more. And then Job talks about how great he is, how, how great God is, and how great the majesty of God is. And we don't have time to look at all the verses, but here in verse 7 he says, God stretches out the north over, over the void and hangs of earth in, in nothing. He's saying God is so magnificent that he put the earth in outer space, hanging in midair. He's just a wonderful God. And then in verse 14 he says, Behold, these are but the these are but the outskirts of his ways. How and how small a whisper do we hear him? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Basically what Job is saying is, we can't understand God. He is so mighty. He is so awesome. And the only way that we can know anything about him is if he whispers it to us. And this sounds exactly what it says in Deuteronomy 29, 29. When in Deuteronomy 29, 29 it says, The secret things belong to the Lord. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. See, there's some things that we just can't understand about God because God is God. He's not a human. He doesn't think like us. He's too big for us. But God reveals some things about him in this word. And those things are for us. And we can understand those things that he gave us. And we can cling to his promises and his character if we know him. Job, you have a lot of anxieties. And you're going through a lot of hard times. And you're staying focused on God and trusting Him. So if Job was here today, what would I tell him? 
If he was on this side of the cross, what would I tell him? And Job, you need somebody to be there for you. And we're going to turn to Matthew 6. And Matthew is in the first book of the New Testament. And in Matthew 6, Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking in Matthew 6. And he's talking in two our time today. And even he could be talking in Job's time. And he tells us how not to be anxious. Are you ready for this? This is a good word that I was talking to you about because we need to hear a good word today. This is right from the mouth of Jesus. And in verse 25 it says, Therefore I, that's Jesus, tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you put on. Is life not more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? Oh, why are you so anxious about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow, and they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall I eat? What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for today is his own trouble. And Jesus is telling us three times here not to be anxious. Don't we think that's important for Jesus? He wants you to know you don't have to be anxious about anything. So what kind of anxiety is he talking about? Because there's some good anxiety. Paul had anxiety for the churches. That was good. So what's he talking about? Is he talking about people that have physical problems with anxiety and that? No, he's talking about, this is what Jesus means. This is a bad anxiety, a bad worry that Jesus is talking about. Are you ready? Is when carrying, when carrying concerns of this world that we lose trust in God. The anxiety Jesus is talking about is when we stop living by faith in Jesus Christ and we start trusting other things instead of other people. When we lose faith in God to take care of us here and now and not just for eternity. So how does this help? How does this help with anxiety? And when we're going through like things like what Job is going through and we get all these negative messages from other people and, and, and outside things from us, and it seems to build on our anxiety, we can remember that Jesus wants you to know that your life is about trusting God, who extremely cares for you. Your life is about trusting God. Not only for your salvation for eternity, but even for your living day by day. Take a look at what Jesus says. He says, look at the birds. Look at the birds. They're not worried about tomorrow, but they're trusting God today. Who knew that the cure for anxiety was bird watching? But Jesus says, look at the birds. They're not reading Facebook. They're not watching Fox News. They're not watching CNN. They're not worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Why? Because birds know that God will provide what they need for today. And you can know that too. Your God created you, and you are valuable to Him. And that doesn't mean you have a relationship with Him. In fact, none of us have born with a relationship with Jesus Christ. All of us have sinned. All of us have turned away from God. All of us have wanted to do things our way and not God's way. And that separates us from God for eternity. But God loves us, and He loves you. And he wants us to have a relationship with him now and forever. So God sent Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, to earth to live the life that was a perfect, sinless life. He did everything that God the Father ever wanted him to do. 
He lived the life we should have lived, and then he chose to die on the cross, paying the price for our sin. Then three days later, he rose victorious over sin, and he went up to be at the right hand of God, and for those that believe in him, he sends the Holy Spirit to live in us, enabling us to be free from anxiety and trusting him to supply our needs now and forevermore. See, if you can trust him for your salvation, for eternity, you can trust him for the day-to-day -day stuff today. Jesus says, man, look at the flowers. They're here this for a short time, and then they're thrown away. But Jesus says, look at the flowers. I will clothe you in eternal glory with me. You worry about a paycheck? I'm going to give you the whole earth when I come back and make a new heaven and earth, and you're going to live on it with me. Don't be worried about a paycheck. You're worried about school and work, and Jesus is saying, you're going to reign with me forever. Don't worry about that stuff. Jesus Man, we say we're worried about our health. Well, God gives us eternal life. And it starts the day we trust in Him and it continues on forever. We don't have to be worried about the stuff of this life. Your life is about trusting God, not just for salvation, for eternity, but the moment by moment, day by day stuff. And number two, we don't, man, anxiety is worthless doesn't do any good. Look at verse 27. It says, being anxious can't add an hour to your life. It's counterproductive. It doesn't do any good. Number three, being worried is something that unbelievers do. Unbelievers worry. Listen to this. In verse 31, it says, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? There's nothing more basic than that. Man, if you're not eating, you're dying. If you're not drinking, you're dying. If you're not wearing, you're exposed to the elements, and you're going to die. He says, don't even be worried about that stuff. For the Gentile, for the unbelievers, seek after all these things. See, Jesus is saying, worrying is something that the world does. It doesn't know me. If you know me, you don't have to worry. Listen, if you don't know the God who is in control, and you don't know him as your father, you have a lot to be worried about today. But, but if you know God, who is in control of all things right now, and you know him as your father, that he is all caring and mighty and all powerful and in control of all things, and he's a loving God, if you know him, just not know about him, but you know him personally and intimately and have a relationship with him, you know that you're his child and he values you so greatly that he came and died and rose again for you. You have no reason to worry. You have no reason to be worried because you know that God knows all your needs. Look at verse 32. It says, your heavenly father knows that you need all of them. He knows everything we need. He knows what we need better than we do. We can think we need need something, but God knows if we really do and he'll supply everything we need, he tells us. You thought Amazon could supply everything until this virus hit, and now you try to get hand sanitizer, the Clorox wipes, and you gotta wait three or four weeks. Amazon, the supply ran out, but with God, the supply never runs out. When you need peace and chaos, it never runs out. When you need courage, when you're weak, it never runs out. When you need strength, God will give you strength to keep going when you don't think you can anymore. When you feel hopeless, hope never runs out from God. When you need life, He'll give you eternal life. That never ends. God will give you what you need, but never usually before you need it. It's usually right on time. God gives us what we need at the exact time we need it, not ahead of time. He gives us the grace and the mercy to keep going another day on that day. Look at verse 34. It says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Our Heavenly Father is right on time all the time, but it's usually not ahead of time. We just have to trust Him moment by moment, day by day, 
and he'll supply those needs. So I started out by saying that we don't want to be anxious because it weighs us down and that we need a good word from God to give us a glad heart. What is that good word? That good word is Jesus. He is here for you even in the middle of a pandemic, no matter what you're going through. Jesus is the good word and he will free you from anxiety. Jesus will free you from worry. Jesus will give you courage when you have no courage. Jesus will not only give you peace, Jesus will be your peace. If you trust him, if you cast your anxieties on him, if you trust in him, you meet your need for today. And if you do that, it'll be like taking off this weight and you'll be free and you'll feel lighter and you'll feel and you have more energy and you'll be able to serve others and you'll be able to trust him more and your faith will grow, grow and you'll be able to glorify him even in, in the middle of a crisis. Let me challenge you. He'll supply all your needs. Right on time, all the time. Just run to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. If you haven't trusted him as your Savior, do that today. And if you know him as your Savior, trust him to meet your needs day by day. Don't worry about tomorrow. That has enough trouble of its own. Just trust God to get you through this moment. Will you take time with me and close your eyes and let's just pray right wherever you are. Jesus says, come to me, all you are, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, some of you today are saying, I don't know this God. I don't know how to come to him and give him my anxieties. And if that's true for you, just say, tell him something like this this morning. Just tell him, Jesus, I haven't been living for you at all. Today, I believe that you died and rose again for me. And I'm claiming you as my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me new. Thank you for giving me the strength to trust in you. If you did that today, you just entered the kingdom of God and you have eternal life forever. And God comes to live in you and will empower you and encourage you to live for, for him. And he'll never leave you. But maybe you're saying to me, Jim, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior and I've been living like an unbeliever. I've been so anxious and I can't stop watching TV and reading Facebook and I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, come to him and give him, give him your anxieties today. Say, just say a prayer like this with me. Dear Jesus, I'm so anxious about so many things. I've been looking at everything else but you and your word. I've been trusting the government to find a fix. I've been trusting that this social distancing will keep me safe. I can't help but listen to what other people say to me, just like they were saying to Job, and it's been weighing me down. Jesus, I'm going to give these fears and anxieties to you. Help me to trust you today to live for you. Help me not to live in fear. Thank you, Jesus, for being my peace. Thank you, Jesus, for being my encouragement. Thank you, Jesus, for never leaving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Like I said, we're here for you this week. If you want someone to pray with you or to come over and talk with you, if you need anything, let us know and give us a call or stop on by the church and say hi. And as you go out this week, may the Lord of peace give you comfort and rest and free of anxiety when you trust him day by day. Church family, until we meet again.